Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. And thank you for joining this virtual special event live. And thank you to those of you who are watching this event recording. My name is Tol Svensil, I'm Minister Councillor for Food, Agriculture and Fisheries at the Danish Embassy in Washington, DC. And I'll be hosting today's event together with my good colleague, Tom Pesek from FAO. I would like to start by thanking all of today's speakers for taking the time to join us in this important conversation. And also thanking all of you that have joined us and are listening in. We would very much like to hear from you in the audience to participate in our Q&A session that will follow the panel discussion a little later. Please submit your questions in the chat box. I would further like to thank our co-organizer FAO North America. Thank you so much for once again, making it possible for all of us to home in on very important issues concerning agriculture. We have a very busy schedule before us today, but also in greater scheme of things. So let's get started. We are facing a growing global population and thereby an increasing demand for food, both plant-based and animal protein. At the same time, our food systems are being undermined, often, at least in part, because of impact of management practices and land use changes associated with food and agriculture. We are witnessing immense and in some cases, irreversible biodiversity losses in countries around the world. This alarming trend combined with advancing climate change as well as water scarcity and the loss and degradation of other vital natural resources underscores the urgent need to transition to a more sustainable agriculture practices and approaches. There's a growing consensus that greening agriculture will require new science and new technologies as well as new and improved management policies and practices. Farmers has an enormous capacity to serve as agents of change in leading a shift towards a greener and more sustainable agriculture. With the right policies and conditions, farmers can play a lead role in transforming agriculture practices. This policy seminar will focus on farmers as agents of change in the green transition. Furthermore, Today's event is part of a larger series of events happening this week around the globe from Asia to Europe to North America with a center in Copenhagen, Denmark. Today and tomorrow, the Danish government is hosting the annual World Food Summit, Better Food for More People, this year virtually. The, sister, the summit in Copenhagen will provide important inputs to the UN Food System Summit in September this year. And key takeaways from our event will be integrated into that larger global agenda. Today's first speaker is Vlimnent Oshan, director of FAO in North America. He will set the stage for us. And then we are honored by two excellent keynote speakers and leaders in this field. From Denmark, Mr. Søren Sønergaard, farmer and chairman of the Danish Agriculture and Food Council. And from California, Secretary Karen Ross of California Department of Food and Agriculture. Then we will hear from three farmers and their story of transitioning into greener practices. Mr. Anders Nørgaard from Denmark, Derek Acevedo from California and Doc Kiesling from Kansas. Then there will be a panel conversation with Setuni Udada, Deputy Director, Climate and Environment Division at the FAO, Thomas Batchelor, Global Vice President of Bioagriculture with Nova Symes North America, and Martin van Luykamp, Global Director for Agriculture and Food at the World Bank. The panel will be followed by a Q&A session, and this event is rounded off by Blimrenta Sharan from FAO. But before handing the floor to the first keynote speaker, Mr. Søren Sønergaard, I would like to welcome Vimlendra Shahan, Director of FAO. Vimlendra, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Trolls. And uh, let me, on behalf of uh, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, North America office, welcome all of you to what I hope will be an extremely engaging and informative 90 minutes of discussion on opportunities and challenges in quote unquote, green transition to a more sustainable agriculture and food practice. For me, what makes the discussion more interesting today is that we get to hear not just from policymakers, we get to hear not just from technical experts, but most important of all, we get to hear from the farmers. Farmers who are the real agents of change and farmers who really bear the brunt of climate change and its impact. Now, since World War II, decades since World War II, world agriculture has become considerably more efficient. 
We have seen production system and crop and livestock breeding programs uh, resulting in significant increase in food production. However, over the same period, we have also seen that climate change, as well as the need for feeding an ever-increasing global population, has exacerbated the existing challenges faced by agriculture. Now, climate change is going to have a profound influence, or rather has already started having a profound influence on agroecological conditions under which farmers and rural populations need to develop their livelihood strategies, manage their resources, and achieve food security and other meet food security and other ends. But towards this end, a green transition is a must. Easier said than done. How arduous is that journey? How arduous is the transition? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities along the way? How do the policymakers, technical experts, farmers, how do they perceive it individually? Are their thought processes and thinking in sync? Now to hear and understand all this and more around this topic, we have a fantastic collection of speakers from which you'll be hearing very soon. But I'll be amiss if I'm not extremely grateful to Soren Sandegard, Chairman of the Danish Agriculture and Food Council, Madam Karen Ross, Secretary of the Department of Food and Agriculture in California, all our esteemed panelists from FAO, World Bank, Novozymes, and a farm of friends joining us from Denmark, California, and Kansas for taking time out of um, very short, extremely busy schedules to be with us, especially those from California for whom it must be 7 or 7.30 in the morning now. Most of all, I'm also very, very grateful to the Danish Embassy in Washington and more specifically to Trolls, Mr. Food and Agriculture and Fisheries at the Embassy and his colleagues for their extraordinary effort that they have put in along with us and our team here at FAO North America to get this event going and to bring this discussion to you. I will not stand in way of some very thoughtful and engrossing perspectives on the issue. And let me, with that, hand over the proceedings back to Trolls to take the event forward. Trolls. Thank you so much, Melinda, also for the kind words, but also for setting the stage so vividly for us and highlighting the importance of farmers in the broader context of a food system transformation. And now to our first keynote speaker of the day. Mr. Søren Søndergaard, farmer and chairman of the main Danish agriculture organization, the Danish Agriculture and Food Council. We are very pleased and honored that you have taken the time to address us here today. Mr. Søndergaard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Trolls. Thank you for the word. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, like we say here in Denmark right now, depending on where you are uh, in the world. It's a great honor for me to be attending today's webinar, focusing on this interesting topic, farmers as agents of change in a greening agriculture. Recently, the Danish Minister for Food and Agriculture signed a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Food and Agriculture in California, focusing on further developing a climate smart dairy value chain. So it's a special pleasure also for me having you, Secretary Karen Ross from California, participating here today. We are looking forward to support and deliver on this memorandum and make the cooperation a success. This is exactly the kind of international cooperation we need for the future. I honestly believe that farmers in reality holds the key to the future climate solutions and could be the ones leading the green transition towards a more sustainable production. And in the next few minutes, I will highlight why this is the case, and I will give a Danish perspective to this very important topic. I am a farmer, and I'm also chairman of the Danish Agriculture and Food Council. Personally, I run a family farm with my wife and four kids. My main production is within pig meat and arable crops. My family have had the farm for generations. I took over the farm from my father and he's still involved in the everyday operations. The organization I represent, Danish Agriculture and Food Council is a private organization covering the full value chain of agriculture and food production. Our members are the Danish farmers, 
including all sectors and size of production, organic or conventional. Members also include the food industry, cooperatives and limited companies. And on top of that, the agro-industrial sector and companies within ingredients and additives and enzymes and bioenergy are members as well. And exactly this composition in our member base gives us a unique opportunity to unite the food cluster, develop strong and sustainable solutions, a complete value chain, and to better handle challenges and opportunities. Integrated in our organization, we have a strong innovation and knowledge center called SIGIS. This is where we get involved in research and develop projects either together with public research institutions or universities or by initiating the projects ourselves based on present or future demands or needs. Via SIGIS, we are able to stay updated develop more knowledge and quickly implement it into everyday farming or processing through our local advisory services. In our organization, Danish Agriculture and Food Council, we have a vision of a climate neutral agriculture and food cluster by 2050. It's ambitious, but we have a clear target and we are committed in getting there. We have already come quite far in living up to the ambition. We work determined in finding progressive solutions in the fields, in the stables, in the feeding, within transportation and manufacturing, and basically in every single link of the value chain. And it's important to identify where you can make a change at the farm. Where can you improve? Where can we invest? And we are determined to get better and strengthen our farmer management tools. We have harvested the low hanging fruits and now it's getting more complicated. We take responsibility and we can do a lot on our own, but we also need cooperation. We need partnerships and we need more R&D in order to get there. And I'm sure my fellow farmer from Denmark, Mr. Anders Nørgaard, he will give you a more specific examples of what we are doing at farm level a little later in this webinar. But there's one thing I need to underline. We are dealing with biology. And many people make the mistake to think we can change or stop emissions from day to day, just like pushing a button. Naturally, this is not the case. Everybody needs to understand that it takes time to change and manage a biological process. I know that time is running and we all want to speed up. However, modern farming is getting more and more complex and challenging. Education and knowledge sharing is fundamental for farmers to be in a position to live up to the expectations from society. In Denmark, we have for centuries had a strong tradition in having a specific system for education of young farmers. All young farmers have three to four years of education before they become farmers themselves. Another proud tradition in Denmark is our knowledge sharing. We regard our neighbors as partners, not competitors. And that is why we have managed to build up strong farmer owned cooperatives between being among the biggest companies in Denmark now, and they have world class performance. And on top of that, as I mentioned earlier, we have established a strong advisory service owned and controlled by farmers, so we can optimize our production in a resource effective and sustainable way by sharing the latest knowledge, for example, from Sigis and share it among all farmers. We engage in international cooperation at all levels. We believe that some of the findings, some of the knowledge, the products and the solutions we have come across in Denmark, they can also lead to a more sustainable production elsewhere in the world. Recently, we have created a global climate task force among our members, and now we are mapping all the many ideas and solutions that can lead the green transition internationally. It's not just about producing sufficient food for a growing population anymore. 
we must produce and manage our farms in an even more sustainable manner. By using our experience, educational skills, knowledge, advisory service, tradition for cooperation and our strong value chain approach in a coordinated and intelligent way, we can deliver. We are and always want to be part of the solution in handling the future challenges. So in conclusion, what we need is first to be regarded as partners, to be included and involved to get a stronger commitment. Secondly, to get clear and consistent signals and directions from the politicians so we are able to plan our investments and our future development. Thirdly, to have a more committed public and public-private R&D approach so we can develop the knowledge, the technology and the solutions we need for the future. A fourth element is to create more incentives for farmers to get engaged and spark the inspiration and motivation. A fifth point is to have a strong focus on developing the agriculture and food sector, not the opposite. And we have to respect the specific condition of a biological production. And finally, to increase international cooperation and partnerships and recognize the international impact of promoting new climate, smart and sustainable solutions and projects. So it is our ambition to create and develop an even more climate smart and sustainable agriculture and food production in the future. We are on our way. So under the right conditions, farmers can show an even stronger leadership in the green transition. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry. So, so thank you very much, Mr. Sunagol. I forgot to mute, unmute. Thank you for your interesting remarks and highly relevant points, um, especially on ambition for the future, education, cooperation between farmers and other stakeholders, and of course, international cooperation. Um, we know you have a very busy schedule today. We are honored that you had time to, to address us, and I know you'll be listening in, uh, but thank you so much, Mr. Sunagol. And now to our second keynote speaker, Secretary Ken Ross of CDFA. We are equally honored that you have taken the time to address us here today. Secretary Ross, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate this opportunity to be with you today. Um, I really appreciated the comments from the FAO Director for North America, so relevant and on point. And to Soren, um, thank you. He stole my speech. I spend a lot of my time trying to tell lawmakers in California that the challenges in farming are that we have to recognize that they are managers of a biological system. And if you change one thing, it's all interconnected. And so I really appreciate that. Now I know that my next climate smart ag trip is going to be to Denmark because I want to meet you in person. Thank you. Um, my friend and former boss and now current secretary of the United States Department of Agriculture recently said, I think agriculture is the first and best way to begin getting some early wins on climate. I think he's absolutely right. I've seen it. I've seen it in California and I've seen it around the globe. I'm really pleased that we're having farmers here today. And so I am going to be very brief in my remarks. But the very fact that the theme of this is a focus on farmers and ranchers as agents of change is exactly where we all need to focus. And I think that a year after a pandemic, when we all feel maybe a bit more directly connected to our dinner plate, there is a renewed appreciation for the role of farmers and ranchers in our daily life. And the opportunity to create new partnerships and new collaborations is the only way that we will be successful because we as government cannot do it alone. Academia can't do it alone. Farmers and ranchers can lead on change, but they should not be expected to do it and bear that responsibility alone. It requires all of us working together to be able to share what we know works, to be able to learn from one another, and to innovate in the ways that I believe the next chapter of agriculture in this globe 
will be an exciting one because of the innovation that is being unleashed on a daily basis through ag technology and other new systems approaches. The whole commitment to building a resilient, sustainable food system, one that nourishes people and nourishes them better, one that is equitable and makes sure that every human has the food they need to achieve their potential and be contributors to society. A, a, a resilient food system that is part of restoring our ecosystems and preserving species and biodiversity. I've seen firsthand that that is possible. And yes, Soren is right. It is up to government to give the appropriate policy signals, not to be overly prescriptive, to be able to recognize that we all operate on the place where we are, that it is our farmers and ranchers and their farm workers who have been on this land for generations and every day think about how to hand it on to the next generation and the one after that. They're the ones that know that land and as stewards of our natural and working lands, they can be the agents of change that we all know and want them to be. So it is our role in government to first of all, give the appropriate policy signals. We've recognized that throughout governments by setting our own climate goals in California as a state, our goal is to be carbon neutral by 2045. And we recognize with a natural working land strategy that is going to be the key for us to be successful. That it is in agriculture and in forestry the opportunity to draw down carbon and store it in our soils. And in doing so, in focusing on our healthy soils, we can be more productive. We can be more drought tolerant with a water holding capacity. We can improve the efficient use of fertilizer by improving the nutrient cycling, and we will be resilient over time. We have, in just the last few years, invested, just in my department, over $400 million that have been made available to us as incentive programs because we use a cap and trade system and those auction proceeds are being reinvested into transitioning our economy to carbon neutral. In total, over the last 10 years, almost $1 billion has been invested in a variety of programs to benefit farmers and ranchers in making this transition. At the Department of Food and Agriculture, one of our largest programs has been for the dairy sector to reduce methane emissions, very important. And in doing that, the co-benefit of that is improved water quality by, by mitigating nitrates and also by producing renewable energy, whether it's electricity, low carbon fuels or renewable natural gas. We've invested over $50 million in the last three years in our Healthy Soils Program. And over a 10-year period, we've invested over $80 million for on-farm water use efficiency, which also has the co-benefit of reducing energy use, reducing greenhouse gases, and improving um, the efficiency of our nitrogen applications. Governments working together, governments coming together and sponsoring forums like this one and the World Food Summit and the UN Food System Dialogues is an opportunity for us to share those best practices to learn which policies work and how they might be adapted for our own country and our own state. I'm excited to hear from our farmers and ranchers today. I am so appreciative and every day I say a prayer of gratitude for our farmers and ranchers for what they do for all the rest of us so that we can live the lives of our choices and not have to worry, I hope, about where our food comes from and we can feel good about what farmers and ranchers are doing because of the way in which they're producing it to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to store carbon in our soils, to use water as efficiently as possible, and to be as part of the solution in preserving biodiversity and restoring our ecosystems. It is possible. I have seen it. I believe it. And we're going to hear from farmers who will give us daily examples of how to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary, for your always inspiring and insightful remarks. Uh, and to your points on that agriculture is you know, local in nature, but it has global consequences. 
uh, and your calls for action and cooperation internationally. I would say we are looking very much forward to hosting you in Denmark sometime soon. As I'm transitioning home, I will be there and uh, greet you. <laughs> uh, I know you have a busy day, uh, but we are very honored that you, you know, took the time and got up early to address us here. And I hope you will be have, have a chance to listen into some of the some of the next speakers. So once again, thank you so much for being with us. And now we turn to the farmers, the steward of the lands and of the animals. First off is Mr. Anders Nørgo, a dairy farmer from Denmark, and he's also the vice president of Holstebro Store Agricultural Council. We are very interested in hearing your story, how and when began the green transition on your farm and what has made it possible. Mr. Nørgo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thanks for inviting me for this uh, webinar. As we have a slogan in Denmark, uh, Danish farmers talk about we don't, um, we are part of the solution, not the problem. So I think it fit uh, pretty well in here. I have made a short presentation because my English is not perfect. So if uh, you can't understand what I'm saying, then I hope the pictures will do the, uh, the, the point for me. But uh, as said, my name is Anders. I'm a dairy farmer from uh, the western part of Denmark. We have about 850 cows and about 750 heifers. We are milking uh, primarily all the cows in uh, 12 uh, Lely milking robots. We have about 475 hectares of land, only with grace and maize for the cows. Beside of that, we have a biogas plant. And as you said, Trolls, I'm a board member of uh, the local farmers union and I'm a board member of Landwar Fødevar Cattle. Um, I've been asked to tell a bit about what we are doing sustainable today at the farm. And I just uh, made four slides about the first things come to my head. We do a lot of small things as farmers who are sustainable, but this is the four, uh, four things who's come first to my head. In 2018, we were building a biogas plant at our own, uh, just in the end of the stable it is today. That means that we don't have trucks or similar to uh, transporting the manure. We are just pumping it directly from the stables into the biogas plant. The biogas plant is producing about five and a half million kilowatts electricity a year. It's the same as six times the consumption of the farm electricity, or in other terms, about 1,200 houses. It runs primarily at manure and dip litter from the farm and the neighbor. And at the moment, we have some waste from the industrial uh, about, uh, for example, we have bread, as you see in the picture, that's uh, pretty funny. Every day we have a truckload. <laughs> And we also run some uh, potatoes who can't be sold, uh, sold because of the COVID-19 uh, COVID um, situation. It makes uh, also better utilization for the, of the nitrogen, especially for the dip leader, but also the manure. But at the dip leader, we move for about 45% to about 75%. So that's uh, pretty sustainable, we think. The next thing. Um, as Søren talked about, we have a lot, uh, we have a long history in Denmark about working together in the whole food cluster. And we are very proud to have uh, today to have the digital feed chain where we can measure uh, all the steps between the field and the milk tank. And if we are following, following the pictures, then in the left corner, we have the chopper at the field, it's connecting to the cloud and the database. So with GPS and near sensors, we can measure the production at the field all the time. We are going into the silo and the database, of course. The third picture is from our wheel loader where we have a tablet solution connecting in real time to the database. So it makes all the registration about the food. And all this is ending up in a daily feeding ration for the cows. The good thing about that is the database, because we have all these measurements, uh, the database is making uh, automatically uh, efficiency report every day. That means for us as farmers that we can go closer to the limits. So we have a better economy for first point. Um, they call, the feeding is the biggest cost at the farm, but we also have better resource utilization of the food. And third, we have better health. So what can be measured can be changed. 
The next thing is about uh, the climate check we have uh, from Ala, our dairy company. Climate calculation can be very advanced and we have a big need uh, as farmers for similar calculations so we can move at this agenda. Uh, that's why we in ALA have a annual report and it makes that we can see the consequence of our actions. It's a very strong benchmark database with about eight and a half thousand ALA owners in five countries, I think. So we have a lot of benchmark uh, data to benchmark uh, us against. And we also once a year have a visit by an advisor where we are only discussing, in this case, the climate issues and where we could do better than today. The next thing is about our herd. Uh, we have a crossbreeded herd. It's not so normal in Denmark, but uh, we are cross-breeded our herd between Holstein, Red and Jersey. And research shows that it makes a 6% lower feed intake of the cows. Uh, that's pretty easy. It's just to insimilate with another, with another uh, genes. And research also shows that we have better health and the cows live longer. So that's one of the things that was coming to my mind. At the next slide, I was asked, uh, what is it that, how do we get the farmers more sustainable and what are you thinking about? And, and we always been told that uh, gold is licensed to produce. In my head, it has to be higher than licensed to produce. First of all, we are a company, we have to earn money. If we don't earn money and we don't have a strong economy, we can't, uh, we can't invest in all the green technologies now and in the future. So that's the main cause. Of course, I'm um, also very important for me to secure the company for the future in a sustainable way. Happily, most of the things we are doing improve both the economy and its sustainable solution. So to get farming more sustainable in the future will require a better economy in farming and a more stable political environment. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Mr. Nargo. Very interesting remarks and uh, very nice to see some concrete examples of sustainable practices. You know, the climate check program and your points on, on biogas, but I think also the correlation between efficiency and making money. You have a family uh, farm that, that needs to run and, and secure for, for you and your family in the future. So I think very interesting. Thank you so much. And please stay on and, and listen in to the, to the next ones. Um, and now we turn to Central Valley, California, where we'll hear remarks from Derek Acevedo, Executive Vice President of Bolt's Farming Company. Mr. Acevedo is part of a sixth generation farm where they produce cotton, vegetables, fruits, and nuts, among other things. Mr. Acevedo, how does bold farming overcome the challenges as modern farming are facing and how have you made the transition uh, in Central Valley? Mr. Acevedo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Yes, and, and uh, Bowles Farming Company is a 162-year-old farming operation where the same family has stewarded that land the entire time. And, and there's, there's an incredible sustainability story that, that comes with that. And during that transition, uh, the, the, the organizations had the opportunity to reinvent itself multiple times. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that you can fall into is a lot of us focus on providing nutrient dense foods for our food shed and, 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 and the consumers that we touch. And then, and as it relates to the, the green transition, you know, my, my mark for that really begins when, when our current CEO, Ken and Michael really looked at, um, you know, the, the simple fact that our consumers are asking for more than, they're asking more of their food than just to produce their nutritional needs. And, and asked us as the management team to look at the farm a little bit uh, from a broader perspective. You know, you can fall into the, the rut of just growing stuff. But if you look at the farm as an opportunity to be a carbon sink, to draw down excess carbon from the atmosphere, if you look at the farm as an opportunity to grow habitat and provide, uh, habitat for you know, the, the birds and terrestrial species we have on the farm, you know, that, that caused us to start a California native seed company where we grow 52 different species of, of California native plants that help provide habitat for the local ecosystem. Um, the farm is also a place to grow our people. As simple as it may sound, you know, investing 
in scholarship opportunities for, for our employees, strengthens our community and helps provide resilience to our, our community and the, and the customers that we serve. Um, perhaps most importantly, you know, our farm serves as you know, a laboratory, uh, a, a place for research. We've, we've aggressively pursued some of the uh, climate smart initiatives that, 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 that Secretary Ross has fought so hard for. And, and we invite multiple stakeholders, multiple partnerships with NGOs and biologists and all sorts of different individuals to come to the ranch and actually advance the, the technologies that we have. We've been on a, a continuous transition, all of agriculture has, um, with producing more food with fewer inputs over time. And so one of the most exciting parts of, of this green transition is to, to witness some of that cross-pollinization between the technology of agriculture applied to native plants and the native plants you know, forcing their way onto some of our agricultural fields and, and offer, uh, offering opportunities potentially for food as medicine and even participating in the, in the textile industry. And so you start to bring in some of our NGO friends, you bring in some of the biologists, the water, you get a chance to, to broaden your scope. And, and, and for all of those reasons, and we can get into more of the, the, the opportunities and, and, and challenges a little bit later in the discussion, but, but for all of those reasons, you know, it's, been, um, you know, it's been incredibly exciting to be a part of. And, and um, you know, agriculture is one of those that, that uh, when, you, when you take that, that, that more zoomed out approach to, to looking at the farm as more than just a place to grow stuff, you know, the, the, the opportunities are endless and it's probably the most exciting business to be a part of in the world today. All right, thank you so much, Derek, for that. I think uh, that was very interesting points uh, you made there on the farms and the practices and great points about consumer expectation, local ecosystem, R&D and corporation and a, a broadened scope for our act in the future. Thank you very much. And now we will move uh, from the West Coast to the heartlands, to Kansas. Our next speaker is Mr. Doc Kiesling. Mr. Kiesling is the fifth generation farmer who has been involved in almost all aspects of farming from crop production to supply chain services and policy. Mr. Kiesling, what is your experience in grow going greener and more sustainable? And what are your recommendations to farmers and policymakers? Mr. Kiesling, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and welcome to all of you. I know that if you're a producer, you had several options today to get on other Zoom calls to learn about sustainability and how to grow carbon for profit and different other things. So I'm glad that you're here on this one. Um, if you're a policymaker and all, you know, this is an opportunity that I can reach out to you and talk to you about our farm and how this works in the bigger picture. First of all, let me start and back up. He told a little bit about my farm. Uh, our farm started in 1876, so I'm a fifth generation farmer, central Kansas, central United States. Uh, rainfall here is 20 to 24 inches of rain, so a lot less than some areas. Our topsoil, and you think I might be crazy, but we only have one inch of topsoil compared to an Iowa or an Illinois or even Central Valley, California. So we take our conservation very serious here because we can't afford to lose any. So uh, some of the practices that we do are focused on that. Um, to wrap up our farm history, we are right on the Santa Fe Trail. Where I'm sitting right here is smack dab in the middle of the Santa Fe Trail. So there's a huge amount of history. And this was homesteaded before, uh, before my family by a doctor. So on our farmstead are a lot of native plants, not only to the Midwest, but from other areas for municipal purposes uh, that the doctor used. So because of that, I come with this rich history of what it takes to make the full circle of the biologicals. Now, on our farm, we've been doing no-till or sustainability for 30 years. Um, now keep that in mind because that's seven administrations that started in Reagan and has come all the way through seven administrations. So when we talk about this, it's nothing new. Uh, it's been going for quite a while, but on our farm, we do everything from conservation, uh, manure management, with it, which includes adding a lot of manure to our land instead of chemical fertilizers. 
We do um, integral grazing to where we will graze different times and different fields. So I don't really have pastures. We use our cropland uh, and rotate that around also. But we do it with sources of using our crops, which we have seven different crops, plus our livestock, about 200 head of cattle, um, in, in a full system of approach. And with biologicals, the cover crops, some cover crops are used in portion of the grazing. Some of it is used just for organic building, particularly if we took over a new piece of ground or we're helping, uh, we do custom work through our business. And if we're helping someone build organic matter just to get started, uh, we start them and help them get started in a plan of building organic matter to capture that carbon to start with. Um, I wanna back up and talk about some terms. We all think we know what it is, but even in the ag industry, we struggle sometimes with the terms. So we talk about carbon sequestering. What does that really mean? Does that mean for me and what I just said that I'm leaving residue on the field or I'm planting a cover crop that will just be mowed in or planted into? Probably, because we wanna capture that carbon for, for later on and we wanna build that organic matter, that one inch of topsoil I talked about. Sustainability. Man, I think we all probably on this whole call, we have 800 different uh, opinions of sustainability. So we need to, that's one goal that agriculture really has is how can we define some of these and, and circle them in so that when we're talking to, you know, the Secretary of Agriculture or our legislators, how can we make a, a rifle point of this is the exact point that we want to talk about with sustainability? Um, how, do, how do we do that? Um, you know, well, we have to build habitat. Uh, one of the other speakers talked about habitat and grasses. I, I hunt, um, but I do it more. My habitat is for water quality because I want to make sure that the water flowing off my farm is cleaner than when it started. A lot of times it'll come in from someone else. It, come, it goes across me. And when it leaves, I want to make sure that that water is clean. The other thing is we farm about 3,000 hectares, which is, or, or do custom work on, which is about 7,500 acres. And so with that, uh, we have gone to where, when my grandfather, two generations back, he farmed a lot of 20 acre strips in order to do wind erosion or water erosion. We now plant the whole quarter or half section. So we might have 320 acre fields now, whereas he had 20 or 40 acre fields in strips. But by doing this new technology, by doing research, we found that we can do this and we can capture the water, make the water cleaner um, and keep wind erosion down. Um, how do I want to talk about some of the partners uh, that we haven't talked about. As a farmer, I view several partners key within this. They might be NGOs, like I serve on the board of uh, cultivating new frontiers in ag, a large NGO in DC, and we do stuff all around the world. But part of that is then we do research somewhere else as I'm traveling uh, to multiple international countries. And then I bring it back to my farm and I improve my farm too. And then I perfect it. And then I take it back internationally to some other country to make that better as I'm doing consulting in another country. So that's a partner to me. Um, community commodity organizations are a huge partner because you know in in Kansas wheat and sorghum and some other crops are the big crops and so wheat and sorghum have done a lot of research in order to how to figure out which is the best way to do conservation tillage how to do the transition over to no-till how to use these tools that we talk about um, and they've also done a lot in order to make sure that our environment's better to where we can take our crops to make ethanol. So that that's the renewable source, uh, how we can use uh, carbon neutral crops in order to sell. I even sell part of my wheat that goes to the East Coast right by DC to make carbon neutral beer. And so, you know, it's all part of the situation of what can we do to make it better. Um, we need the more technology. One of the things I struggle with is using less fertilizer, a synthetic fertilizer for like nitrogen. I use manure, but that's one of the things that, you know, I still need help with on more research in order to, to get over that hurdle so I can raise more crops with less fertilizer. Uh, a lot of the things we do, that also helps with water retention. Uh, I've already kind of talked on that. 
some of the concerns that agriculture in the Midwest have is the cost versus the return ratio. For me to implement some of these practices, it might cost $40 an acre. And currently my return may be half that. And so as we uh, talk about bills or legislation or just trend lines, how can we incentivize farmers to do more? They already want to do it. And I'm already doing things that cost me money more than make me money, but I'm doing it because it's the right reason. I wanna do it for my environment. I drink the water here. So I wanna make sure that it's better than, than what it was when I started. Um, and then the other thing is, is, is I travel so much. Um, the one key thing that's hard, that's a challenge that, is weather. You know, here I'm getting 20 some inches. In West Texas, it might be five inches. So they have a hard time raising a cover crop and raising a crop also. So things like crop insurance uh, and all these things we think doesn't affect climate smart activities, but they do uh, because it affects the farmer's bottom line and how do we move forward. So all of these things, and this is a lot to put in seven or eight minutes here, but that's kind of what we do. And I hope to have questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kiesling, for those interesting perspectives. Um, and uh, yeah, please stay on. I'm sure there will be some questions for you. Um, some interesting perspectives on con conservation and soil, manure use, crop rotation, and how farms are integrated in the local biology. And of course, also on your points on knowledge sharing and partnerships. So thank you so much. And now, um, and before I hand over the floor to Tom Pesek, who will be moderating the panel discussion and, and the Q&A session, I would like to remind the audience uh, that we would very much like to hear from you. I know there's a few questions in the chat box, but please submit some more questions there. And then uh, Tom will, uh, will take them up during the, the Q&A session. So Tom, over to you. Excellent, thank you, Charles. I think we've heard a, an excellent series of remarks, uh, very insightful remarks from Chairman Sundergaard in Denmark and Secretary Ross in California. And of course, from our farmers uh, hailing from Denmark and the United States. In this portion of our event, we will hear more of an international or a global perspective on some of the key challenges and opportunities associated with farmers serving as agents of change in greening agriculture. And we have the very good fortune of being joined for this panel discussion by three prominent thought leaders in this space. And I would like to turn first to my FAO colleague, Zaituni Oldada is Deputy Director of the Climate Environment Division, based typically at FAO headquarters in Rome, but I believe today he is joining us from the UK. Zaituni, welcome. Thank could you. you tell us a bit, could you tell us a bit about how FAO is supporting farmers as agents of change in greening agriculture and how farmers are being engaged in the global climate agenda to help achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement and the broader 2030 agenda. Well, thank you and um, greetings everyone from wherever you are. This is really very interesting discussion and having listened to, to the colleagues who spoke already, um, it, it's good to, to see the perspective from, from that part of the world. Um, so let me start by um, answering qu your question by looking at the global agenda. Yeah, in FAO, we, we, we're supporting farmers at, at two um, fronts, if you like. The first one is on the global agenda, exactly as you said, because globally, um, there are various initiatives and policies being put in place that will affect farmers, will affect the future of farming. So it's important that farmers are part of that dialogue, are part of how the future of farming is being framed, is being um, um, influenced and, and, um, and challenged. And particularly on the international climate change agenda on the UN framework convention on climate change and the implementation of the Paris Agreement, uh, we support farming communities actually to come to the negotiation, to see what it's like, to see what is being discussed, and to give them the opportunity to have a voice actually to, to say what are the challenges they're, uh, they're facing and what are the issues that they would like to see really being addressed to achieve this sustainability that we talk about, to achieve the transition. And the point I want to make here with this global action is that, you know, the discussion we've been hearing and, and, and the views so far, um, I would like to add one dimension in particular, which, which we haven't covered, 
and, and that of the smallholder farmers. You know, we spoke a lot about farmers who have capacities and knowledge, etc. Uh, but 98% of the world's agricultural holdings are 10 hectares or less. And most of these smallholder farmers are in developing countries and you support around 2 billion people. So it's really critical that so when we talk about the change that we, and the sustainability, we need to include smallholder farmers. In Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, in particular, we have 80, about 80% 80 of farmland is cultivated by smallholder farmers. So th this is really critical to include this, this um, community of farmers. So the second point I want to make um, is with regard to support infrastructure. I talked about the global agenda and bringing farmers to where they need to voice their concerns and their priorities and their wishes. But the second point is supporting actually farmers in their countries to adopt um, climate smart practices, but also, as some of the colleagues said, you know, to have access to the knowledge, to the information, those farmers who actually would benefit from, from access to technology, from innovation. And here again, I want to highlight the point of when we talk about innovation and technology and supporting farmers, we shouldn't forget about the local knowledge, the traditional, the indigenous knowledge. And that's absolutely critical because um, farmers do learn from each other and the knowledge is transferred from generation to generation, from community to community. So I hope this gives an, an overview, um, Tom, and give a chance to other colleagues to, to come in and happy to come back and, and add more information. Thank you. Thanks, Saituni. If If I could, just like to ask a follow-up question. I think in this session, we've been hearing quite a lot about how uh, if we're to address the, the climate challenges we face, we can't forget about agriculture. And you've just reminded us that in considering and addressing agriculture, we can't forget about smallholder farmers. So within that, could you talk a bit about the role and the importance of, of youth, of young farmers, and especially women? Yes, absolutely. Well, I think, um, you know, we, we, we think about the fact that if you want to achieve, and I think this is the point to take away, if you want to achieve this transformation in agriculture, we cannot do it without involving farmers. It's absolutely critical. But looking into the future of, of farming and, and where actually, um, you know, the, the communities can be more active, we can't exclude the youth particularly in some parts of the world where uh, the population is, is very young. And take the example of Africa, for instance. And I think we have to take that into account into looking into the future of agriculture. And the role of, of youth is, is critical, but the challenge, the biggest challenge there is how would you make agriculture attractive to young people? You know, how would you bring uh, young people into the... In, into this profession. And as you know, in many areas, there is, um, you know, there is a problem in rural areas where young people are fleeing the rural areas to go to, to live in, 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 in urban uh, areas. And that creates, of course, problems in, in the rural areas and also creates the lack of capacity uh, in, in taking up um, profession in, in agriculture. So there needs to be incentives in, in uh, in, in terms of creating investment opportunities in helping young people to have access to finance. There are so many entrepreneurs who have ideas, they want to create things in, in, in rural environment, but they need that financial support. And I'm talking particularly in, in developing countries. And women in particular, I think the biggest challenge, either young or otherwise, is the land tenure, uh, particularly in developing countries. I think colleagues have been talking here about, you know, the, the establishment of farms that you have with the size, etc., and the capacity. Then, in many developing countries, unfortunately, there are many smallholders, holder farmers in particular, um, to whom the land is is not their property, and that's again a huge challenge in in really contributing to food security and land protection without being the owner of of. Um, of the land. The last point I would make, Tom, is, is, is really with regard to inequality. Uh, that's again with regard to, to youth and, and, and women. It's absolutely critical that the issue of inequality is addressed in these settings so that the 
access to technology, access to finance is, is, is really uh, available to everyone and is, is, is affordable by everyone. And the point, the, the reason I'm saying this is because if we really want to achieve global sustainability, then we have to address equality of access to knowledge, to, to, to technology, to the resources that are needed. Thank you. Thanks so much, Saktouni, and, and please don't go far from your, your laptop. I'm sure we'll be turning to you momentarily during the q and I'd now like to introduce Martin Van Nukup, Global Director of Agriculture and Food at the World Bank. Martin, we've heard uh, quite a bit about the importance of um, farmers and their role in catalyzing a transition to greener and more sustainable agriculture. And I think that that inherently assumes that they're sufficiently empowered or equipped to do so. And Zaituni just touched upon the question of finance. And, and given your role at the bank, at the World Bank, I was wondering if you could uh, talk to us about the bank's assessment of the relevance of current public support to agriculture and, and in enabling farmers to serve as agents of change. Very, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Thomas. I'm very pleased uh, to be here. Um, and just for the sake of transparency, you know, originally I'm from the Netherlands and I actually grew up on a family horticulture farm uh, in the western part of the Netherlands. So I'm very pleased to be here with, with all the farmers, uh, still very strong roots there. Um, I, I, think, I, I think, I mean, Anders was talking about, I mean, we need stable policies. I think Surin was talking about we need clear signals from governments and Derek was mentioning, you know, I mean, the importance of incentives. Um, so if you, if you kind of look at that, I mean, um, based on the data, the best data that we have, I mean, governments across the, the world, I mean, provide about $700 billion in public support, I mean, to agriculture. I mean, this is a big uh, amount of, of resources. So the question then is, you know, what is that doing for farmers? A um, couple of reflections there, uh, Thomas. One is that, you know, most of that support, I mean, doesn't, doesn't end up, I mean, with the smallholder farmers, as Situni was saying, actually, most actually ends up with the larger uh, farmers. Um, a big chunk is about 300 billion is provided for markets and price support and output uh, support. Uh, this generates a lot of allocative efficiencies, actually providing incentives to farmers to grow crops that actually shouldn't grow and, and better they should grow something else. I mean, uh, think about farmers growing rice in the Punjab in, um, in India. Uh, a lot of uh, public support also going to input subsidies. Um, uh, that also leads actually to overuse of fertilizers uh, uh, and that creates all kinds of environmental problems and of course doesn't actually help the farmers uh, bottom line. Uh, electricity subsidies for pumping irrigation water, I mean, depletes groundwater tables that actually forces farmers to invest in pumps. I mean, that uh, pump of water deeper and deeper and actually thereby is undermining their resilience. Um, uh, also, one could argue that uh, if you look at fertilizer subsidies, um, uh, to what extent are they actually relevant if you factor in the, uh, the risks, the increasing risk of climate change. I mean, what, what's the value of a fertilizer subsidy if a farmer doesn't have anything to sell because if crop is destroyed because of a drought? I mean, what's the value of a minimum price? I mean, for a certain crop, if the farmer doesn't have anything to sell because of a, of a heat wave. Um, so, so our assessment is, I mean, that uh, this $700 billion, I mean, can be used much better. I mean, actually to incentivize, I mean, farmers to invest in greener, more sustainable technologies that also that actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, can this 700 billion be repurposed? And that's a very important uh, point that we actually are bringing up globally, Thomas, uh, as part of the Food Systems Summit. I mean, that the UN is working on, the bank is very active in the finance lever of that. I mean, to think of a kind of a new food finance architecture for the global food systems, where farmers have clear incentives I mean, to invest in green technologies and sustainable practices. Back to you, Thomas. Thanks, Martin. You touched upon the question of incentives and you talked about some of the opportunities uh, on the horizon uh, to, to support and, and um, further enable farmers. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more as you look out across the international 
agricultural development landscape or, or horizon, if you will. Could you tell us what excites you in, in terms of the opportunities before us to help empower and equip farmers to effectively serve as agents of change in, in greening agriculture? Yeah, a, a couple of uh, reflections here, Thomas. I mean, one is um, the discussion about just about just rural transition. Um, uh, that was launched after the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019. I think that's very important, you know, because there's, there's, there's something strange going on here. I think that was also reflected when you listen to um, our farmer colleagues, uh, you know, that farmers are kind of be singled out as being part of the problem. Uh, you know, and farmers want to be part of the uh, solution. Uh, you know, if you talk about just transition, you know, the way coal miners are being projected in the public opinion is not as being part of the problem. They're being seen as victims and we need to help them. Well, farmers actually, um, you know, we need to, you know, human mankind, I mean, 7.5 billion people, we're all affected by climate change. But the 500 million farmers in this world are actually in the front line of climate change. I mean, so how can we actually help them and incentivize I mean, to kind of make sure that they can actually help deal with the climate change, because in the end, I mean, the 7.5 the billion people depend on what farmers do when it comes to access to food, et cetera. So, so given farmers' voice, uh, I think that needs to be improved. I think the Just Rural Transition Initiative, I mean, provides opportunities uh, there. I already mentioned the uh, shift in incentives. I mean, particularly now with COVID-19, I think governments are forced to take a very hard look at the public support programs everywhere in all sectors, uh, including in agriculture. So I, I see a kind of an opening up of ministers of finance, including at the spring meetings that we had last week, and seeing actually how they can use public support to agriculture and food more smartly. Um, I mean, why are we why are we subsidizing fertilizers? I mean, why are we not providing incentives to farmers? I mean, to invest in soil health. I mean, why is the uh, price of carbon, the market price of carbon? Uh, $10, while the uh, shadow price, the opportunity cost of uh, carbon is estimated by the IMF at $70 a ton. I mean, imagine if that would be $70 a ton, what kind of incentive would that would provide to, to farmers? Uh, and then finally, uh, what farmers need, uh, and I think the, 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 the Secretary of Agriculture of California mentioned it as well. I mean, they manage these of biological systems, no? So solutions do not come as silver bullets. Solutions do not come as blueprints. I mean, they come in packages and those packages need to be adjusted, I mean, to local conditions. So investing in agricultural innovation, more applied research uh, and adapted research and better knowledge transfer systems uh, are needed. And there, and there I'm optimistic, Thomas, I mean, that the digital uh, technologies and the digital revolution and digital and data-driven agriculture provides new opportunities there to transform the food system. Back to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Martin. And you've made my job quite easy in providing the perfect segue to our uh, last panel speaker, but uh, certainly, certainly not the least. And uh, I'd like to now introduce Thomas Batchelor, who is the Vice President of Agriculture Marketing and Strategy at Novo Zymes. And I'm hoping that Thomas can take us on a tour or a visit to the laboratory, as it were. Thomas, Martin just mentioned uh, the importance of research. And I was hoping you could talk a bit about the role of research and science and innovation in helping to create the enabling conditions for farmers to effectively serve as agents of change in ushering in more sustainable agriculture. And of course, within that, tell us, of course, the, the role of Novozymes in, in achieving this. Yeah, I'll be happy to thank you. And I think it is a perfect segue uh, from all the other speakers here because in times we, we are a global market leader in, in developing biological solutions for the broader agriculture and food value chain. Um, and, and our controlling shareholder is, is a foundation, Nova Foundation, that also reinvests a lot of our proceeds back into fundamental research in, in this area. Uh, so it is it's very much our vision uh, to be driving uh, this innovation so what we are focused on is, is really this biological system we all talked about, uh, unlocking the potential of that nature. If we look at the comment from, I feel this talk about applying manure back to the field, 
understanding that microbiome, so the natural microbes that are in the soil and in the manure, if you take a teaspoon of, of soil, it, it comprises uh, microbes that exceed the number of people on the planet. It's an incredibly complex system and the potential of just unlocking what nature already has holds tons of potential. So what we're looking at is developing those uh, microbes and enzymes, which are natural compounds as well, and applying them for agriculture at, at an industrial scale so growers can apply them uh, and they can be adopted as a natural part of, of agricultural practices. Also for livestock farming, a similar, the microbiome within uh, cattle and so forth is, is also one of the ways we can succeed for solutions. The methane reduction that was mentioned for, for dairy and cattle, a lot of potential for that. And, and that's exactly what Novozymes is, is driving and investing very heavily in uh, to succeed uh, enabling uh, more sustainable agriculture of the future. And if I can allow just kickstarting the reflection on, on some of the things I hear here, because I think it was perfect comment on there's incentives, which I think just looking at the real value that's provided for not only our solutions, but others, making sure we create a real marketplace that, that creates a profit for a farmer applying the right practice is one thing. But I think there's an even simpler starting point, allowing a route to market for new innovation that is more expedited. So we have safe and proven solutions that are spot on for some of the agendas we are talking about today but it still takes five to 10 years to get them there because we're, we're going into the pre-existing chemical regulatory frameworks often uh, that, that we think we can find ways of enabling a faster way to market and to the growers hands just by having more of the fast track mindset using some of the COVID experience. And if we really want solutions to the market, we can cut the time to get them out there. And I think that's part of the solution that I would uh, argue should be seen as, as, um, as a way forward. Excellent. Thank you, Thomas. And if I may, I'd like to ask a bit of a follow-up question. Novozymes, of course, is, is widely recognized as a leader in providing and developing sustainable solutions for the agricultural biological industry, and particularly in developing solutions that contribute to solving uh, the global challenges related to climate and water and, and production, as well as consumption. And so within that, could you just elaborate a bit more? I know you've uh, touched upon some solutions, but within all of this, could you elaborate a bit on Novozyme's perspective in terms of some of the biggest challenges and opportunities you see perhaps over the next 10 years? Yeah, I think uh, the greatest opportunity is, is to make sure that, that we get innovation in the hands of, of farmers and get it widely adopted. And that's a mix of the incentives and the path to market. Um, and then realize making both growers, but, but also policymakers aware that technology actually already has solutions that can kick uh, start some of the changes we have. But as in many cases, there, there's a huge benefit for accelerating that adoption in various ways. And we're already partnering with, there was a mention of SEGAS, trying to have these partnerships where industry like ourselves partner with both growers and organizations to make sure it's not seen as a corporate push of profit, but it's a solution that's adopted broadly from policymakers, growers, and industry as, as partners. I think that that will unlock a lot of value. And if we're a little bit creative about combining incentives, helping growers decipher a very complex technology, so getting some validity from an unbiased side, I think that adoption can be accelerated hugely to the benefit of, of all the targets we're talking about. Excellent, thank you, Thomas. And to our audience, thank you for your excellent engagement and, and patience. We're now turning to the question and answer portion of our event. And I see we still have uh, almost all of our speakers still with us. I would now, based upon what's been posted in the Q&A box by our audience uh, by way of questions. I would now like to um, turn quickly back to our three farmers and to ask them each uh, very briefly to talk about what they see as the big opportunities uh, in engaging young farmers uh, in this transition and perhaps talking a bit more about incentives. So perhaps if I could start with, uh, with Derek. Thank you. Um, 
it, you know, as I, as I mentioned, agriculture is one of the most exciting fields on, on the planet. And a lot of the technology that's been introduced uh, to agriculture over the last hundred years has provided opportunities for non-traditional roles on the modern farm. We know we've had a, a, a position on our, on our management team, a vice president of technology for the last five years. We have a biologist, we have, you know, we have, um, you know, different food safety folks, and we've pulled people from other industries into our farm to, to broaden our perspective, but at the same time provide opportunities for folks that, you know, they, they never saw their, their, their role as, as being working with a farm, but the, the data management that we go through, the analysis that we go through, I mean, farming is a science-based profession. You know, the modern food supply is, is grown by agronomists, you know, biologists, chemists, pest control advisors, all these different science-based professions that provides a lot of opportunity for, um, for young people to, to enter the role of farming. And to speak briefly about, about incentives, you know, I, I thought about, you know, how, how do we simply define the, you know, the role of the policymakers and, and the opportunity uh, that we have by showcasing the voice of the farmer? And what I came up with was, you know, the the, the implementation and the success of, of, of meaningful policy will simply be judged based on the ability to provide rewards to the private land steward who protects the public good. Excellent, thank you, Derek. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Doug uh, very briefly, if you could uh, respond to the same question. Sure, I think there's a couple of different things. Some of the more logical ones is help through uh, organizations like 4-H or FFA for Future Farmers. I have two high school boys. My two oldest kids are in high school and they both belong to those two organizations and have learned um, quite a bit there. One of the things I'd like to highlight is my 16 year old son was offered some land to farm and from an older farmer and he could not do it because the rules under our US uh, F um, through our government uh, say that because he's under 18, he can't have it in his name. So the farmer had to turn it over to me. Now, granted, he's gonna be, I'm gonna make sure that he's actively involved in helping, but sometimes we're our own worst enemy is what I wanna point out. Thank you very much, Doug. And I don't believe, um... Our Anders, our, our Danish farmer, is uh, is still with us, um, so I won't uh, turn to him. But if I could, uh, I would like, if possible, to pose a question from the audience to Secretary Ross, um, which comes from Cecile Makani, and the question has to do with whether it's possible uh, to have effective partnerships between farmers in developing countries and those in developed countries uh, such as the United States? I think it's possible. There was a time in, in US history where we funded organizations to do exactly that kind of farmer to farmer um, transfer. And I think Doug mentioned he's had an opportunity through his organization to travel the world and take his research to other parts of the world. I think it's absolutely vital to what we're doing I think it can happen farmer to farmer, but I also think the investment that's made in the US, we're very fortunate to have the cooperative extension system, which is publicly funded, that third party objective source of doing trials and then sponsoring demonstration days for a group of farmers to learn from one another. And I think that is an important place when I look at the world, at the world bank, I think that is an important incentive that it's the research but it's that transfer of knowledge. And I know that our cooperative extension, even though it's underfunded from what it once was, is still the envy of the world because it's helping to do that transfer of knowledge and translating in a way that the end user from the smallest to the largest for animal and for crops. And I think these are the types of things we need to think about globally and, and lobby our own governments to make those kinds of investments as well. Thank you very much, Secretary. Um, I don't believe we still have uh, Chairman Sundergaard with us, so I won't pose the same question to him. But if I could, I'd like to turn to our three panelists from the World Bank, FAO, and Novo Zymes, uh, perhaps in that order, uh, Martian, uh, Zaituni, and then Thomas. 
The question we have here comes from Ernie Shea. And um, Ernie indicates that um, it's often hard to understand um, how the voices of, of farmers can be elevated in institutions like the World Bank, FAO, Novo Zymes, uh, as well as how their voices can be uh, accentuated in initiatives such as the UN Food Systems Summit uh, or in the broader climate agenda, which was touched upon earlier. So Markian, beginning with you briefly, if you could share your thoughts on how the, the voices of farmers can be further emphasized within institutions and, and international processes. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, uh, Thomas. Um, le let me start at the global level. Um, I, you know, I already mentioned that uh, as part of the upcoming Food Systems Summit, I mean, be very active um, as part of, you know, putting in place the food finance architecture. There's a finance lever there. Um, we are actively reaching out and working very closely, I mean, with um, federations of farmers organizations to make sure that their voice is being heard. I mean, the World Farmers Organization is, for instance, an example of it. Uh, I think that's very important uh, because there are many organizations who claim, I mean, to speak on behalf of the farmers, um, but if you then talk to the farmers, I mean, they tell me that's often that's not the case. So having the authentic voice of the farmers by reaching out I mean, to membership organizations is, uh, is key. Um, at the country level, uh, when we do financing for the agriculture sector and uh, a major kind of, you know, act policy reform programs where we're working with governments in um, redirecting public support along the uh, lines I mentioned earlier, um, I always tell the ministers of agriculture you know, if you cannot explain what we're trying to do in the projects that we finance to a farmer and how it actually benefits her wallet, I mean, then it's a losing proposition. Uh, so actually, you know, having that perspective to kind of think through and calculate through, I mean, what those reforms mean for farmers' wallets is key. And then at the final level, at the lowest level, in the, um, at the project level, I mean, because most of the bank financing is channeled, I mean, it's all kind of projects. Uh, I mean, we take public consultation, I mean, very seriously as very part of, you know, of, um, of our kind of project preparation procedures. Uh, we work very closely with local farmers organizations. Lots of the funding actually is directed to those organizations. Um, the kind of the, 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 the where we do the, the economic cost benefit analysis of project. I mean, ultimately that's calculated based on the beneficiaries who most of the time are farmers. Uh, so both at the global country and local level, I mean, we are kind of, you know, reaching out at all those levels to make sure that farmers views actually are integrated. In. And, and, and that's key, I mean, to success. Back to you, Thomas. Thanks very much, Martin. So Tony, over to you, the same question, if you could discuss, uh, how the, the voices and perspectives of farmers can be further elevated in institutions such as FAO and in international processes. Yeah, well, thank you, Tom. Well, first of all, that question raises one, one issue, which is, well, who are the farmers we're talking about? You know, the, the farming community is not homogeneous. So we need to, to make sure that we're talking about heterogeneous uh, community of different backgrounds, different capacities, different knowledge. Uh, I think Derek was saying that farming is a science-based profession. Yes and no, it depends to whom. You know, there are farmers who had the opportunity to be educated and to have access to knowledge, to digital technology. And there are smallholder farmers, obviously, who are, are uneducated. Some, some are uneducated. They don't have the same level of capacity, the same level of access to knowledge and, 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 um, and learning. So when we talk about you know, the, the access, as you were saying, we have to, to just distinguish between the fact that we're talking about different kinds of people in different kinds of settings. And I think that's absolutely critical. So we don't give the impression that we're talking about farmers in general and everything we're saying, all the solutions we're talking about, they're going to apply to everyone, they won't. Um, and the second point I want to make again with, with, with your question is the fact that um, there are possibly uh, two avenues. The first, which is, um, again, farmers who have 
access to be involved, to be engaged, and they can be invited to, to the table, you know, either at FAO or other processes, no problem. They can travel, they can have access, they can read, they can contribute, fine. Um, and, and those who can't, and this is the second category, then you have to find other means of doing that. And the other means are to use the national representative, the national policymakers, the MPs, the ministers and others who can bring their voices to, to these platforms. And also the NGOs, the NGOs, they play an important part really in connecting with the local realities, with farmers and bring those um, needs, those, those priorities that they have, those asks, to, to, to the platform and that's absolutely critical. And the last point I would make, particularly in the current era where we're talking about technology and innovation, then we need to reach out to farmers and listen to them. It's very easy to film these days. So you can go to any community, ask the, the farmers the questions. You know, we're talking about change. How can we make any change if we don't know what the farmers want? How can they be involved? Can they, in what circumstances and how? And also just to distinguish about the changes we want to make. Some of the changes are big and challenges and demanding and some changes for some small communities, just little changes will make a huge difference to the survivals, to the livelihood, to the income. And that's absolutely critical. So my, my, my point is we need to be uh, proactive as well to go and find farmers and, and hear what they want to say. In some context, you know, they don't have time to be involved in, in global agenda. They, they, they have other worries, other priorities. So we need to go and see, well, how can we help you? They're never going to think, whoa, whoa, there is a conference on climate change in Glasgow. We better go and, and take part in that. Absolutely not. So we are responsible in reaching out to those people. When we talk about leaving no, no one behind, that's what it means. Go and find the people, see what they want and take ownership and, and help them. Thank you. Thanks, Titania. I think you raised some excellent questions and made some, some very important points there as of course did Martin. Um, before turning to Thomas, I would just like to flag that uh, just after Thomas, I would like to turn to each of our speakers and ask them very briefly in about 30 seconds to 45 seconds to share with the audience what their key takeaway message would be. If the audience is to remember one thing that each of you has said, what would it be? Uh, so please begin giving thought to that. But before turning to each of you respectively, I would like to ask Thomas to respond to this question of how the voices and, and perspectives of farmers can be better amplified within institutions or organizations or, or companies. Um, and also, if I may, very briefly, Thomas, a secondary question for you, which has come in from Lauren Hirsch, um, asking about what some of the key research gaps are still in need of investment. Over to you, Thomas. And you can actually link a little bit because I think one of the things that, that uh, we as, as um, kind of corporate uh, innovation drivers uh, lack sometimes is actually the engagement with, with farmers early on to really make sure that we develop solutions that fit into the reality. It's simple application realities, economic windows of reality, because you have great lab work, but it never hits the market because it's misunderstood the application reality. So that's a simple, uh, you should be easy, but it, it really isn't. But we have so many, as we've exemplified today, farmers that are progressive, and actually eager to engage. And, and that kind of engagement is, is critical. And then I would, would tagline it over to the second part of the question of also creating these partnerships and alliances. It can be with co-ops or individual farmers, because sometimes it's also, what is the willingness to pay if there's not a market for methane reduction or if there's not a credit given for carbon capture or soil health, which is a longer term gain than a yield one year, well, is it, a, is it a product concept or not? And some farmers would love to pay for it, but they can't afford it. And then you need to link it back to policy making, incentives and so forth, and coming as a joint a representation of farmers and not as a corporate innovator that's being perceived to seek profit only, creates a much better partnership for policy dialogue and so forth. So I think that there's many of these, which are these gaps that was asked to, like soil health, um, um, methane reduction, which, which are nebulous business cases because who will pay for them? Uh, so that answers kind of that question. There's a, a long list of business opportunities 
which should have capital value for a farmer, but doesn't today. And if we can find a way to get that via incentives and, and get a fast way to market, that would be great progress. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Thomas. I hope I'm not being too ambitious here, but with the time that remains, I would really like to turn to each of our six speakers who are still with us to ask them in about 30 seconds to share their key takeaway message with our audience. And if I could start with you, uh, Secretary Ross. I was afraid I was gonna be first and there was so much here. Two things I'm gonna to touch on. One, um, I think Thomas mentioned that we're trying to create some biological solutions and trying to fit them into a regulatory framework for chemistry. And I think that really is something every country could take a look at. And two, thank you Zatuni for your comments because I'm keenly aware California Ag is very diverse. We have the smallest organic urban farms all the way to the larger multi-generation, but the small farmer and how do we engage on a global basis if we really wanna make a difference, that's where we're going to have to really work together and create partnerships. Thank you. Thanks so much, Secretary Ross. Back to you, Thomas, for your key takeaway. Sorry, me? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, I, I would keep it back to the, the central point about the potential and innovation is there. It's a matter of, of unleashing it and getting it in the hands fast and in an efficient way. Regulatory fast tracks, ways to enable farmers to adopt fast would be my key takeaway. Excellent, thanks for your brevity. Uh, Martin, over to you. Thanks, thanks Tom. Um, I, I start um, you know, by referring to what Derek said, you know, we need to reward private land stewards who protect, I mean, common public goods. So, so my takeaway is that, you know, we need to kind of provide farmers the right incentives to do so. And when it comes to uh, making farmers better agents um, of change in greening agriculture, I think we need to provide them the right incentives so that we actually can move to a situation where we, it's, where it's recognized and where we redefine I mean, what it is to be a farmer in the 21st century. I mean, not just a producer of food, but also a provider of ecosystem services and there should be revenue streams attached to that. Thank you, Martin. Um, Zaituni, over to you in 30 seconds or less, please. Thank you, Tom. Well, three, three points I would say. The first one is definitely to include smallholder farmers and to listen to them. The second point is to recognize the importance of indigenous and local knowledge. And the third point I would make, which we didn't touch on it much actually, is changing models, but also changing our mindsets, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Aituni. And I think it's only right and fitting that our farmers should have the, the final word, as it were. So if I could turn to Derek and then Doug, each in about 30 seconds or less, please. Uh, Derek, over to you. Thank you. I think the, the sentiment from farmers everywhere is they feel like the villain and, and absent from a lot of these conversations. That's simply unacceptable. Not only is the farmer uh, play a critical role, but uh, we have a lot to be proud of in the food supply that we provide everybody. And not only is the farmer the, you know, not the villain, but, but, but critical to the solution and the answers lie on the farm. And so um, again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to share our thoughts and, and you could have had hundreds of thousands of farmers from around the world participate in this discussion and you have had equally diverse and interesting perspectives from each one of them. Thank you, Derek. Doug, over to you. Yeah, um, on a couple of these topics, you know, some of the organizations are doing this. Uh, we built a $40 million research facility to, to study these type of things. Uh, greenhouses, the whole work, sorghum is working on it. They're even doing virtual reality work with international markets. Um, international grains program was developed in Kansas and at Kansas State University in connection with about seven or eight different commodities to address these issues. Um, so farmers are reaching out doing a lot of this. I think a lot of these governmental entities and organizations are not reaching out to the farmers like myself and others um, because that work is being done. And, but my final takeaway is just include the farmers in these rules because we all got to do it. And as much as possible, the best way to do that is by making the carbon a free market system, because if it's free market system, as alluded by some of the others, the price of that carbon capture could go up and it will naturally happen. Thank you so much for today. 
Thank you very much, Doug. I would now like to turn the floor back over to our moderator, Trolls. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you to the audience for all your excellent questions and uh, to our panel and speakers for a very insightful conversation. And thank you, Tom, for moderating it. And thank you for being the mastermind behind this event. Uh, Tom and FAO did most of the heavy lifting uh, behind this event. So hats off to you guys. And now I would like to hand off the floor to uh, Vimlendra from FAO once again, this time for some concluding remarks. Vimlendra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Trolls. And you've been quite modest. I think the embassy really took it upon themselves to make sure that we have the event as successful as we did have it today. So it was an extremely engrossing discussion. And I think uh, even to expect to be able to do justice and summarize what we heard in five minutes, I think it's, it's been on my uh, capacity, but I will try and uh, uh, bring out the main issues which I heard today, uh, both from uh, the policymakers, the uh, technical people looking at the global issues and definitely from the farming community represented by uh, three farmers on, online today. Uh, I learned a lot and I realized that more uh, productive and resilient agriculture will require transformation and management of natural resources and higher efficiency of in use of these resources and inputs for production. We heard, uh, to start with, we heard from Soren Sondergaard that farmers hold the key, and this point got reiterated again and again, uh, including till the very last in, in takeaway messages, that they hold the key and they will be the one who will have to lead the transition. He also emphasized the need for a very effective partnership and strong R&D along uh, with uh, strong incentives for farmers to bring about this transition. Uh, Secretary Karen Ross, thank you for reminding us that agriculture will perhaps uh, be the first and best way to begin getting some wins in climate area and your emphasis on keeping sustainability and biodiversity from center in our policy prescriptions. The greening of agriculture will also present an enormous innovation challenge of producing more food and fiber without relying on most of the technological mainstays of productivity gains of the past. So we need to innovate. And uh, we saw how Andre Nargo has led his organization in sustainable practices through biogas plants, digital feed chain, climate check, et cetera. And Andre, we totally agree with you. You're definitely not part of the pro uh, problem. You are the solution going forward. A new demands are also being placed on agriculture and it is being asked to replace environmentally damaging products and protect biodiversity and mitigate climate change, as well as address livelihoods and lifestyles. And uh, what better way to go ahead with this than to follow the initiatives by, shown by Bulls Farming Company and the Kiesling Farms, which see farms not just as a place to grow, but also to make farms work as a carbon sink, as a habitat to promote biodiversity, and also a place to grow human resources. So the need to do all this, and they have argued it very strongly, is to, mention, is to maintain that farming remains as a remunerative activity. We heard the community talk again and again about how farming is no more a very remunerative activity and how the youth is turning away from it. So thank you, Zatuni and Martin, for bringing a global perspective to it. Uh, Zatuni told us about FAO's effort at integrating farmers' voice in the global agenda and also in hand-holding farming community at country level to make to take to cut climate smart agriculture. And thank you for emphasizing once again the need to remember smallholder farmers because many times in our debate in North America, we tend to focus on what farming is in and around this part of the world, but to remember the 98% of the farming community is still farms and 10 hectares and less. And your emphasis on being grounded in our traditional knowledge, but looking forward to the future and having the capacity and the courage to embrace modern science and evidence. Martin, thank you so much for explaining so well the need to better apply and target public resources going into agriculture worldwide. Uh, can the $700 billion be used much better? Can they be repurposed? I think that's an extremely uh, strong phrase. How do we repurpose 
the 700 billion going in to ensure that they actually end up incentivizing farmers to invest in green technology and sustainable farming. And that will require a lot of coordination with policymakers, policy framers across the global, especially in the global south. Thank you for spotlighting that farmers are in the front line of climate change and the need to understand that they are the victims and not the cause. Thomas, you so rightly highlighted the importance of biological solutions for agriculture and food value chains and the fact that they exist and the need to change the regulatory framework to ensure that the land, lab to land transfer happens extremely fast and the need for understanding the requirements, the, uh, the economic reality, the implementation reality of bringing modern science to, to the land. So if we take all this together and summarize, I, I think I'm being too ambitious to put it, putting it in one sentence or two sentences, but I would say that the potential of new science innovation, knowledge, technology, and partnership to contribute to sustainable and green agriculture will depend on policy finding a way to manage these changes in a way that provides a balanced outcome for the society and the environment and ends up help incentivize the farmers to make the transition. So it, it, the policy has to give the right signal and with that signal and partnership and knowledge and innovation and science and finance and, and, and we need to go forward, always keeping the farmer as the focus point, as the focal point and ensuring that he's front center of all our policy making. So as we close this discussion today, I think we need to take these lessons home and we need to help promote the urgent need to transition to green and sustainable agriculture. Um, I'm sure all of you would have uh, taken your own uh, lessons from the various points made by our speakers. And I would end by thanking all of them to have taken time out of their busy schedules and attend this, help us understand the issue with their ideas, their thoughts, and their perspectives. Thank you so much. And uh, back to you, Trolls. Thank you so much, Vimlendra. Uh, as always on the point, um, and that uh, concludes today's special event. I think it has been a very interesting conversation and a, a much needed one. Um, we have less than 10 years to reach the sustainable development goals and some of the ambitious national goals for CO2 reduction. The clock is ticking. And even as we are still in a dire situation with COVID around the globe, there is hope. Uh, as we have heard today from farmers, from government, global organizations, private sectors, there is a great potential that can be unlocked and that farmers and other actors in the supply chain around them can adapt and engage with agility in the transformation for a more sustainable future. So once again, thank you so much, all of the speakers, for your great contributions. And thank you to all the audience for, for listening in. We're sorry we couldn't take any more of your very good questions. Uh, you have been a very active audience, so thank you so much. Uh, but I'm sure the conversation continues. It needs to continue. Um, so thank you so much, all of you, and have a Nice rest of your day. Thank you.